The great thing about standards is there's so many to choose from. Selecting parts for your DIY drone, this time on Hack 5. Hey everyone, Glitcher, and welcome back to Hack 5. Today we're going to be selecting parts for our DIY 3D printed drone project and looking at the different standards and motors and power requirements and everything that goes into building a DIY drone. We can't quite start the frame design until we've figured out what motors, flight controllers, and so on that we want, batteries and all that. So let's dive right into that. The first thing we need to do is decide what size our drone is going to be and what kind of power requirements we want to run it on. So in our case, we decided in the last video that we're going to be making a 2.5 to 3 inch drone. And that's the measure of the propeller diameter. So we're going to be running it on two and a half to three inch propellers. We're also going to be using 2S batteries. Now I've done videos on battery construction and uh, details of that before, but to give you a quick rundown, S is how many cells in series the battery is. So a 1S battery is one cell or 3.7 volts nominal. 2S is two cells or 7.4 volts nominal. 4S is like 14.8 and so on and so forth. Now, there are drones out there, massive ones, that run up to 12S or even 20S batteries. They're using really custom proprietary stuff, but on average, the highest you'll see in the hobby is about 6S. Now, I think we're going to be sticking with 2S for a couple of reasons. It keeps the components cheap. It reduces how much power you can really put through the drone, so you're less likely to burn something out and less likely to have more power than you know what to do with if this is your first major FPV drone build. And it just keeps everything a little more structurally sound. The biggest hurdle with 3D printed drones short of crashing into something is the actual strength of the arms and the consequence of them folding or snapping due to too much torque or too much thrust. In a 2S drone, we shouldn't run into any of that, so the design will be a lot more tolerant of any mistakes we make or any uh, miscalculations we make. So with that said, we're going to be looking at motors. Now, motors come in a bunch of different sizes, and their sizes are measured using the size of the stator. So an 1105 motor is going to have an 11 millimeter diameter and 5 millimeter height stator. A 2204 is going to have a 22 millimeter diameter and a 4 millimeter height. Now, stator diameters in and of themselves aren't very useful. We also need to look at the power requirements the motor has, what voltage is it designed to run, what kind of prop sizes are good for it. And then we also need to do a static thrust calculation with our desired propeller size and pitch to make sure that we're going to be within that stator diameter. Now, some motor companies will be nice enough to give you a data sheet with a few different prop sizes and brands that give you an idea of how much power you can expect it to pull at full thrust, half thrust, and so on. These are really useful. However, if you're looking at cheaper parts or less common parts, you might not get these numbers. So running a quick sanity check using a static thrust calculator is a great way to check on that. Now, I mentioned prop size and pitch. The prop diameter and the prop blade count and the pitch is going to affect how much power these motors are drawing. The pitch of the prop is actually what determines the top speed. The diameter and blade count will determine static thrust. Static thrust is, as the name implies, the amount of thrust you get while the prop is being held still. So if you put it on a test stand and you crank the throttle all the way up, you might get 300 grams of static thrust. In flight, you'll actually get a little bit better than that because the blade won't be chopping its own air and will actually be more efficient. So static thrust calculations are basically worst case scenario. It's like trying to do a burnout in your car. You're going to be putting the max amount of power through every component along the way. Now, I think for this build, we're going to be running 3 inch diameter, 2.5 inch pitch tri-blade props. These are really common and you can go down to two blade props for more efficiency if you want longer flight times, but less aggressive maneuvering. And you can go up to four blade props if you don't care about your flight time and you want to just have balls to the walls, max power. And now that we know what kind of prop we want to run, we can also determine what kind of power we're going to need to drive that, which will help us determine our motors, which will help us determine everything else. So let's have a look at that. Now, this is the static thrust calculator I have been using for years, and I'll have it linked down below, but it looks like it's from spencersgoesflying.net. Uh, so we'll plug in our desired prop diameter, so a 3-inch prop with a 2-inch pitch. And for propeller type, I usually just do standard propeller. There are other uh, aero profiles in here. However, these don't really match up with anything we're doing. 
So standard propeller is going to give us a close enough uh, CF. And the RPM. Now, this is a number we can derive from roughly what kV of motor we want. That's another detail of motors I forgot to mention, is they are rated by kV. Now, most people who are into electronics know kV means kilovolts. That's not what we're looking at here. K is an arbitrary letter chosen for RPM, V is for volts, kV is the RPM for the amount of volts going in. So in our case, we're going to be running the motors at 7.4 volts nominal. And once you get in the field, you kind of can guess at what size of motor you might need or what kV. So let's say I want to use 7.4 volts with 5,500 kV motors. That's going to give me a peak absolute maximum RPM of 40,700 in an ideal world. So we'll plug 40,700 RPM in and we'll go to like 68 Fahrenheit. Obviously, air density will change as your altitude changes. So if you're going to be flying mostly in hot climates, you might want to go to a slightly higher temperature. And then number of blades, like I said, ideally, most of the time we're flying with a three blade plop. So we run calculator and it looks like we're going to be drawing 0.094 kilowatts or 94 watts to generate roughly 230 grams of thrust. With a top flying speed in an ideal world of 96 miles an hour. Now, you aren't going to run into that for a variety of reasons because this calculator isn't taking into account things like drag and wind resistance and battery sag and all of that. So odds are we're probably going to top out about 70, 80 miles an hour in a dive, which is more than enough for this frame. Now, the other check here is that 94 watts. You want to see how many amps that's going to draw at our nominal battery capacity of 7.4 volts. 12 amps. So that means we're going to need an ESC capable of 12 amps to run this, which is good to know because the flight controller I had picked out is 5 amps max. So let's see what it'd take to get down to our 5 amp peak here. So let's say we want to go down to 4,500 kV motors instead of 5,500. So 4,500 times 7.4 volts, that puts us at 33,000 RPM. The interesting thing to note here is as we change RPM, our thrust is going to drop dramatically, but our power requirements are going to drop even more dramatically. This is not linear with RPM. As the RPM goes up, I don't want to say it's an inverse square law situation, but our power requirements go up dramatically as well, given a, a certain prop size. That's much more reasonable. 52 watts is going to put us at 7 amps, so still a little on the high side. The other thing we can do here is drop our number of blades to two. 36 watts. Perfect. So I changed our requirements a little bit, but this is still going to be a completely excessive drone. And you can always up the prop size a bit or cho choose a different flight controller. So just like that, we have figured out what wattage of motor we need to be able to run to fit within our requirements for our flight controller. We've also picked out the flight controller. And we also know our prop size, 3 inch at 2.5 inch or 2 inch pitch, depending on how much thrust you want. Now, the next thing we need to do is figure out what exact motor we want. Like I said, we're looking at a 4,500 kV motor with a max power of 45 to 50 watts. Having a little extra overhead is always good. That's going to put a square in the territory of an 1105 4,500 kV motor. Conveniently, I have those sitting right here from Mamba with two blade props already attached. Looks like I know what I'm doing, doesn't it? I don't. Now that's a lot of our technical details out of the way, the things that have to be the way they are. From this point forward, we get to decide things like cameras and video transmitters that don't really have a huge technical effect on the actual drone. Uh, you could go and put a DJI air unit in this because it is a 2S system and it needs at least 2S to run. And you could actually use digital HD video. Now I'm making the assumption that a lot of you are trying to get in this hobby on a budget if you're actually going through and 3D printing your own frames and you don't want to use DJI because it's not a cheap setup. So we're gonna be looking at analog hardware. In this case, we're looking at the Cadex Ant camera. This thing is adorable. It is extremely small, extremely lightweight and has really good dynamic range. It won't have as much low light capability as something like the Runcam Owl series, amazing cameras if you want to get into night flying. Not that you should do that. The FAA says no. And then our video transmitter is going to be a Zeus system because we, well, are already using Zeus hardware and it all mounts up magically and just works. The interesting thing about this video transmitter is it's switchable and I believe it goes up to either 200 milliwatts or 400 milliwatts. 
You can find higher transmission power ones, such as 800 or even 1100 milliwatts. However, they're going to generate a bunch of heat, and that's going to go up exponentially with the amount of power you're using. So I think staying to 200 to 400 milliwatts for a drone of this size is going to be a good idea, because odds are you're flying it within a park and probably not near a whole lot of RF interference anyway, and this will be enough power to punch through and give you what you need to do. Now, the other decision we need to make here is a more personal one, and again, a budgetary constrained one. I personally use a TBS Tango radio. This is my modded TBS Tango 2 and it uses the Crossfire transmission system. Crossfire is great because it's a bi-directional 900 megahertz telemetry system that will give you information on battery. You can even hook up a GPS and get GPS coordinates where your drone is, so you have a built-in tracker. Uh, it is also just a very robust system. Like I said, it runs at 900 megahertz rather than most other systems that run at 2.4, where all of the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and everything is that can interfere with your signal strength. However, it is not any necessarily an affordable option. I got my start using FrySky 2.4 gigahertz. I think it was like the IS-36 or something. Uh, I'll have the radio I used, got my start with linked down below. The receivers are really cheap. It all works, but they can be kind of a headache to bind. So I would definitely recommend springing for Crossfire. if This, this is a hobby you're going to really get into and you're going to be flying multiple drones. It makes it really easy to switch between drones, bind, and set up your transmitters, and so on. However, if you're on a budget and you just want to get started, FrySky is a perfectly useful system, and you can pawn it off on your friend later when they want to join the hobby and fly with you. You're also going to need FPV goggles, or at least an FPV display. I personally like the small compact goggles, like the Fat Sharks or the ones I was using, the Fly Sights. However, you can get something called box goggles that look a lot like the DJI ones and fit over glasses. And they're also way more affordable because they just use a display at the end. And for a lot of people, they actually look better. You might like the look of them better, but they are a little more bulky than the Fly Sights, which I liked portability, so I gave up a little bit of visibility. I wouldn't recommend you do the same. Just get a cheap set of box goggles to get your start. They'll work perfectly fine. Now, other than the actual frame and all the little bits of M2 screws and mounting hardware and all of that have been chosen. So at this point, we can design our frame in the video after the next video. Uh, with hardware shortages right now, the rest of the parts I need aren't going to be able to come in in time. So in the next video, I'm actually going to be doing a modification to my DJI FPV goggles so that I can still fly analog drones. There's a few other analog drones I want to build and fly, and so having both digital and analog capability in one set of goggles is going to be really awesome. So stay tuned for that video. I hope this has helped you figure out what kind of components you want to run. I'm going to have links to everything uh, in the description down below. And you can also make some decisions yourself if you want to change what kind of motors you're using or what kind of prop sizes or the FPV equipment and so on. One thing I neglected to mention is there are multiple different sizes of flight stacks. We're going to be using the 26 millimeter standard for our drone design. So if you want to be able to print the exact frame I'm using, make sure you stick with that. However, if you're designing your own frame and just using this as a loose guide, you can absolutely change the size and spacing of the holes and accommodate 30 millimeter AIOs that can handle much more current. You can make this thing an absolute monster with a thrust to weight ratio in excess of five to one if you really wanted an absolute rocket. Just again, watch out for those arms. Make sure you strengthen those. Thank you all for watching. I've been Glitch. This has been Hack5. Glitch out. Thanks for supporting Hack5. Find all our shows, community, and Pentest products at hack5.org.